the uh, Honourable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. Mr. Speaker, in an Earth Day talk I heard April 17th, Chaplain Jason Van Vigel would ask the question, what's the 800-pound gorilla on the basketball court? The question refers to something that's large and important, something that everyone should know about, but which is somehow ignored as people get distracted by less important things. The question related to a famous psychology experiment by Shabri and Simons in which students were instructed to watch a video in which they were to count the number of times persons passed a basketball back and forth. The students were good at counting the number of passes, but when questioned, half of them failed to notice that during the game, a man dressed in a gorilla suit actually crossed the basketball court, thumped his chest, and spent 10 seconds on the video screen. So, Mr. Speaker, as we consider the motion brought by my NDP friend this morning, I ask, is there a gorilla on the court? Are we missing something more important than the specific question being posed today? Let me come back to that question in a moment. As a British Columbian, like many others, I'm concerned about the fuel leak from the Marathasa in English Bay. But as a maritime nation, Canada relies on marine transportation for the success of our economy. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I've heard that most Canadians don't realize this, but 92% of Canada's economy floats in salt water. Think of the grain, the natural resources, the finished materials that we ship overseas or that we receive by sea. And BC ports handle almost 40% of Canada's international marine traffic, more than any other province. Our government is focused on creating jobs and economic growth. A thriving maritime trade sector continues to be a key pillar of Canada's economic opportunity. But Mr. Speaker, safe and efficient marine transportation does not happen by itself. The dedicated men and women of the Canadian Coast Guard spend day and night ensuring safe navigation so that Canadians from coast to coast to coast can enjoy the quality of life we're so fortunate to have in Canada. The Coast Guard accomplishes this important mandate by having highly trained men and women in its ranks, specialized equipment at the ready, and a fleet of over 115 vessels strategically deployed across the country. In addition, it maintains strong partnerships with other organizations such as the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue in BC, which has proud and effective stations and vessels in at least five parts of the riding I represent, West Vancouver, Squamish, Gibsons, Pender Harbor, and Half Moon Bay. For friends and neighbors who believe that my riding is the most beautiful place on earth, we look to people like them to keep it that way. In other words, we British Columbians have a personal stake in maintaining the pristine nature of our coastline. Events of the past two weeks have shown that we do have a world-class system in place. Reasonable people agree that does not mean perfection, but what does it mean? Well, what would we expect to have in place in a world-class response system? We'd expect the minimization of oil spills in the first place, a containing of the leak, committed people there to respond, top communications networks in place, good coordination among the various parties, oil out of the water fast, and a minimizing of injury to waterfowl, fish, plants, and humans, the whole ecosystem. And what did we see in the response to Mar Marathasa oil spill? Well, we saw newly implemented regulations that govern foreign vessels that require them within 96 hours of entering our waters to advise what is their emergency response plan. We saw 2,700 liters of bunker fuel spilled into the water. We saw a Coast Guard boat in the water within an hour and a coordination among a vessel of convenience, aerial surveillance, and the Coast Guard. We saw the Coast Guard working through the night to boom the spill. 80% of the oil collected within 36 hours and over 95% within four days, leaving just 0.3 liters in the water. Yes, there were beaches closed, but there were hardworking, trained people who were there to clean those beaches by hand. And we saw a wonderful populace in British Columbia, people that take these things seriously for our environment, our tourism, and our very identity as British Columbians. And Mr. Speaker, we saw, thanks to our Conservative government's polluter pays law, that the company and its insurer will pick up the tab, not Canadian taxpayers. Contrary to much of the speculative comments made by opposition and others following the Marathasa incident, the Coast Guard has been clear that its response was not affected in any way by the former Kitsilano base. Mr. Speaker, this fact has been repeatedly stated by both the Commissioner of the Coast Guard and the Assistant Commissioner. 
the Kitsilano station was a search and rescue station, not an environmental response station, and was therefore not equipped to conduct an operation of the magnitude required during this incident. It is certified environmental response organizations that have the capacity and expertise to respond to these types of emergencies. And as per protocol, it was one of these organizations that was contracted by the Coast Guard. Mr. Speaker, we saw four pillars of preparation in place. Investment by this government in maritime safety that paid off. There were area response plans. Mr. Speaker, in BC, the Coast Guard maintains marine pollution response equipment in three major centers, Prince Rupert, Richmond, and Victoria, as well as equipment caches in 12 other communities. These caches contain a variety of response equipment, including booms, skimmers, storage tanks, protective gear vessels, and other supporting equipment in order to handle a wide range of situations. The Environmental Response Program maintains a duty officer presence 24 hours a day, seven days a week. These duty officers are the first line of defense to marine pollution incidents and ensure all reports of marine pollution are investigated and that an appropriate response is undertaken. When the Coast Guard needs the support of certified environmental response organizations, like the Western Canada Marine Response Corporation, as in this incident, it can do so through its emergency contracting authority. A second pillar is the navigation aids. Mr. Speaker, our government has modernized our marine communications and traffic services centers. This modernization project is replacing the Coast Guard's current outdated marine communication technology with a state-of-the-art platform that will improve the safety of those at sea. Thirdly, we've seen improved transport regulations like the polluter pays principle that I've already referred to. And fourthly, as was discussed by the Parliamentary Secretary, an expansion of the Coast Guard fleet. Since 2009, this government has delivered nine midshore patrol vessels and 11 smaller vessels, including the pollution response vessels that support the environmental response program in BC. Going forward, Mr. Speaker, our Conservative government has committed over $5 billion to build more, more Coast Guard vessels, many at C-SPAN in the riding I represent. So what are we seeking when we talk about a world-class response system? Well, remember, excellence is not the same as perfection. While we had a world-class response, that does not mean that we can't do better. What would have prevented the oil spill in the first place? Maybe there were preventive measures that should have been in place. The District of Seashell, in the writing I represent, has called for an independent investigation. We need to be committed to independent, objective reviews if we are to adhere to world-class standards in what we do. And yes, perhaps there are better protocols that could improve the communication systems. The Coast Guard has already committed to an independent review, as discussed by Commissioner Jody Thompson on CBC last week. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Coast Guard people who worked so hard and efficiently, the cleanup crew, people who worked to clean the beaches, and the concerned public, people like Mr. O'Day, the boater who alerted the Coast Guard in the first place. But if you ask the wrong question, Mr. Speaker, you'll get the wrong answer every time. The NDP in this case focuses on too narrow a question, a question about the installation that was at Kitsilino. What is the 800-pound gorilla on the court? Is it provisions of one base or another? I say no, Mr. Speaker. We have to take this to 30,000 feet if we're truly committed to an excellent environment and an excellent economy. If the goal is to score cheap political points on an unacceptable incident, then sure, we can look at a policy decision that focuses on specific installations. But the installations are not the resources we need in which to call to attain a best-in-class result for the environment and the economy. Mr. Speaker, it was Earth Day yesterday when a billion people celebrated the 42nd annual event. And yes, we are connected to one another and to our environment. So when it comes to our government's promotion of the economy and jobs, we all know this may mean an increase in vessel traffic in English Bay, House Sound, and up and down the coast. Like many British Columbians who care about jobs in the economy, we accept the presence of these vessels in our waters, but only in the event of world-class marine safety. And in our pursuit of excellence for our country, we mustn't follow into polarized, mind-numbing, vacuous debate. I ask my friends of the opposition to be open to a true spirit of continuous improvement as we protect our marine safety I pledge to do that. I know my colleagues do. And Mr. Speaker, we mustn't say stop. Stop to our growth as a country. We mustn't say 
we must not say no, we must say no to the stop mentality, and I say yes to independent objective science-based processes that will deliver to get the best guidance in how we keep our economy thriving and our environment the best that it can be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments, the Honourable Member for New Westminster Coquitlam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I <clears throat> thank my Honourable Colleague for his uh, intervention. However, I, I don't know where to begin on all the, the, uh, the claims that he made in his, in his uh, speech, uh, but I hope that he will start by supporting this motion. I think that's the first thing that this member from British Columbia can do, is listen to the people of British Columbia and support this motion. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I wonder if his uh, area, his, if West Vancouver was affected by this spill, if his uh, beaches have reopened, if he can talk about the impact of the fishery that uh, I know he's on, or has been on the fisheries committee, impact to marine uh, mammals and wildlife. Um, he talked about the, the spill being 2,700 litres. Uh, we don't even know that, Mr. Speaker. That was from a flyover, and uh, we're, not, uh, we're not sure how big that spill was. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, he talked about modernizing the uh, state, of, uh, state of the art platform. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if he actually talks to the Coast Guard, he'll find that uh, there's still problems with the in-nav system that they haven't been able to work out over eight years, and they have to actually use post-it notes at times when the system crashes. My question, though, to the member is he calls this a world-class oil spill response, or an oil, a, a world-class response. And I'm wondering if he's spoken to Fred Moxie, who's the former commander at the Kitsilano Coast Guard Station, who will take an affidavit to say that the government is not telling the truth. Those two members that he quoted are not telling the truth about the Kitsilano Coast Guard Station, the role that it could play in a strategic response, the training and the equipment that it had available at the station. The Honourable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, City Sky Country. Mr. Speaker, it's an unfortunate aspect of our adversarial system that when you're in opposition, everything has to be a no or a stop or a wrong. What I would love to see is my NDP colleague coming together and saying, how can we get together and, and make sure we have a world-class system? How can we conduct the independent review that the Coast Guard is actually committed to do? And yes, Mr. Speaker, I have spoken to the Coast Guard. I've spoken to the Director of Operations as the situation was unfolding. And yes, it was he who verified with me that this government has invested in improving the transport regulations, in improving a tailor-made kind of a area response system rather than a cookie cutter system that would apply right across the province. That it has invested in navigation response technology. That these things will be all uh, uh, reinforced by an expanded Coast Guard over $5 billion in Coast Guard vessels. Mr. Speaker, we're not talking about perfection. We're not talking about saying stop to an economy. What we're talking about is a commitment to excellence, world-class excellence. We've seen it, we're gonna to continue to see it, and yes, we can still improve. Questions and comments? The Honorable Member for Trinity Spadina. Well, the, the House has just heard that we have a world-class response system, but we should be working together to create a world-class response system. Either we have one or we don't. Uh, the, the, the reality facing cities in this situation is very similar to the rail accidents we're seeing across the country. Cities aren't notified, and in particular in Vancouver, cities weren't notified. Public beaches were kept open, even though toxic substance was washing up in the soil. School children were playing in it, and there was no notification because cities weren't included in the process. But we've also heard, and this is very concerning, that everything happened within an hour. Yet, yet there were private yachts that were reporting the spill and nothing happened for up to five hours. And it was the absence of a proactive approach to safety, one which they seem to embrace when it comes to terrorism, but they walk away from when it comes to public safety and every other walk of life in this country. Why is this government so resistant to proactive environmental processes that protect Canadians? Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. Mr. Speaker, it's a fallacy to say that world-class processes means that you don't ask questions. In fact, a world-class process means that you're committed to reviewing what happens after an incident like this. You're committed to making it better. And yes, the Coast Guard has already said that the protocols can be improved in terms of the notification. The Coast Guard notified the province and expected the province to notify the city. And that didn't happen fast enough. And it's going to happen faster next time. That's what world-class means, Mr. Speaker. World-class means 
continuous improvement. World-class means daring to look at the best practices from around the world to adapt them and make them peculiarly Canadian. And Mr. Speaker, that's what this Coast Guard is committed to do. That's what this government is committed to do. Yes, we can have an economy that walks and chews gum at the same time. Yes, we can have a pristine coastline and we can still export our resources. The opposition would say no, would say stop. I say yes, we can continue to improve and yes, we will do so. And that's what world class is.